for the third year and counting, Richard Skipper has been celebrating the artists you love. And what are some of the things that you've really run out of time? And, I, and we've got to talk about your latest. I want to go back a little bit, first of all, and celebrate a true legend. Richard Skipper is all about celebrating life, art, and his guest body of work. And did you pursue performing opportunities while you were in high school? Please join us while he showcases these diverse and talented individuals. Here's Richard Skipper. Happy Monday, everyone, and welcome to the latest edition of Richard Skipper Celebrates. Who or what are you celebrating today? I am very excited today because I have an incredible man on this show today. Uh, my dear friend, Rose Apuzo, uh, who I know is watching right now, is waiting in the wings, and she is ecstatic. She's going to be even more ecstatic uh, when I tell her before we went live. I asked James, uh, who is your favorite singer? And uh, his wife is going to be even more ecstatic because he says, well, besides my wife, <laughs> who I could not pull up on my device, I won't mention her name because she'll go off, uh, he said, Barbara Streisand. And of course, later next month, we are going to be celebrating Barbara Streisand's 80th birthday on this show. Some people are very, very fortunate. Uh, if they get the opportunity to get close enough uh, to Barbara Streisand. Uh, but our guest today uh, got incredibly uh, close uh, to Barbara Streisand uh, because he danced with Barbara Streisand. Uh, there he is right here, uh, right here in front with Barbara Streisand uh, in a film that some of you may know called Hello, You Know Who? And uh, anyone who knows me knows that Hello, Dolly uh, has a very special place in my heart uh, because I have been chronicling Hello, Dolly and all of the incredible women who have played Dolly for so many years on my site, callondolly.com. But we're going to be talking about so many things today. And James, I am so thrilled that you are on the show today. Uh, but I want to ask you before we jump in, who or what are you celebrating today? Oh, today, I think uh, what I do every day, I celebrate the fact that uh, we have the blessing of being alive and, uh, and, and able to do what we want to do, you know, without uh, holding back. And it's just, you keep your spirit high you know, and you you rule out passive and negative thing, you're positive, it brings good things to you. So every day. We're going to start with that. And I always start my shows with a random question. And it's a question that I haven't even looked at. So I don't even know where we're going to start with this. That's it. Isn't that bizarre? But that tells you a little bit about me. And the question that I'm going to ask you is, if you could never work again, how would you spend your time? Oh, never work again and never dance again. Well, uh, and I know how much dance means to you, which we're going to go all the way back to the beginning uh, because I've done a little research and I know that I can't even imagine your life without dance. Well, neither can I. But however, I, I, I've given some thought to it, what I would do. I would still continue to teach. Um, over the years, uh, I developed a... a a passion for teaching that is just uh, it's a uh, it's become a calling because I love the opportunity to give uh, some of my knowledge back to younger people who want a career in this business and want a life in this or or even if they're not dancers, just uh, what it takes energy wise, what it takes work wise, and commitment, and how to uh, how to remain there when you get there. You know what it take what it takes to to get what you dream of. You know, well, it's just basically that. What do you think? I mean, if dance did not exist in your life, God forbid, what do you think that you would do with your life? I mean, my um, I I've got my own thoughts. I think that you would probably write about dance, or that you would find some way to make it a part of your life, uh, because it's such an integral part of who and what you're all about. I would definitely write about it. 
for sure, and express it some way, and also adjudicate. I really enjoy adjudicating dance festivals and seeing the babies, you know, and talking to them. Um, my father wanted me to be a logger and a construction worker and a mechanic, just like him, you know, which my brother did, I didn't. Uh, so I often thought I probably, because I got, when I was uh, training in Los Angeles, I was coming home to Boise, Idaho for six months, and then I was going back down to LA for six months. This is all during uh, w uh, when I was in junior high school and before I graduated high school. And it was, uh, I'd, I'd do any kind of job to make enough money to go back down to Los Angeles. And uh, so I did, I worked as a logger, I cut trees, I bucked them, I drove logging trucks. Uh, I got to tell you one cute story is that there was a drive-in theater, uh, not theater, drive-in restaurant on uh, in Boise, Idaho, called the Howdy Partner Drive-In. Hmm. And it had a, a roof that went out and cars parked on either side. And uh, the owner of the place was uh, had he was able to play the piano really well. And uh, I was a soda jerk working downstairs making making sodas and sundays and all that kind of stuff. And on our breaks, we would go up on the roof, and he would play the piano, and I would tap dance for the people in their cars, and they would be munching on their hamburgers, and then honk their approval, and you know, and I just did whatever I could possibly do to earn enough money to, to go back down to Hollywood. Well, I know that you are a Midwestern boy, but where did this love of dance begin for you? Uh, did you, I mean, were you this kid that went to the movies on a regular basis? Uh, who was it that first caught your eye where you said, that is who I want to be like? I want to follow in their footsteps. Uh, who was that idol that you wanted to be like? Well, it was certainly Gene Kelly and Michael Kidd. And the film I, that inspired me to want to dance was It's Always Fair Weather. Wow. Yeah. And, there, and there's a wonderful dance in the, in the alley with the tin can lids, you know, where they tap dance and that. But that was the movie. My mother said so my mother liked movie musicals. She would take my brother and I to see a movie musical and, and maybe because she loved it. And uh, afterwards, she said, I tried to dance down the street like Gene Kelly. <laughs> and she said, maybe, maybe you'd like some dance lessons. So she took me to the one and only dance school in Boise, Idaho. It was called the Lillian Winger School of Dance. And Lillian Winger and her daughter became my teachers. Uh, from that moment on, at eight years old, I don't remember not wanting to get home and practice. But there's a hitch, a real hitch. My dad's a logger. And we lived in the primitive area of Idaho in a logging camp. So on, on Friday night, my mother would drive me two and a half hours to Boise, Idaho. I'd have my dance lessons on Saturday and Sunday. Then she'd pick me. We'd go home, and I'm in the woods. I'm in the deep woods. So in order for me to practice, my dad and my grandfather drug in two logs into our trailer area and nailed some planks across. And that was my rehearsal floor under the trees and the stars. And that's how I was able to practice. Well, believe it or not, I knew George Kelly, uh, Gene Kelly's brother. Uh, I got the good opportunity of knowing him when I first came to New York. And he told me also that when he and Gene Kelly were kids, and they both were dancers, that um, being too young straight boys dancing uh, in Pittsburgh, that uh, they were uh, bullied a lot. So I know that being a Midwestern boy dancing, did you have the same experience? I can't remember being bullied ever. Oh, that's great to hear. I'm glad to hear that. Because it it just, I don't remember any anything like that. And if it did happen, it never Phased me, and I've always, always been that way. I knew what I wanted to do, and I did it, and I loved doing it. And I don't remember being bullied at all. That was so to the effect that it bothered me, you know, and within it, it was hurtful. That's amazing. I'm glad. I'm so happy to hear that. But you, so you're taking dance lessons, everything. But I also read 
that at 17, correct me if I'm wrong, but at 17, you started teaching. Yes. Yes. Well, my, my, tap, my first tap and jazz teacher in Los Angeles was Gene Nelson, who was the star of the wow. movie Oklahoma, yeah. played Will Parker. And he took me under his wing and became a mentor of mine. And uh, he would go off and do work. So he asked me to sub for him and when I was just turning 17. So I subbed for him his, sub, his classes at, at Nico Charisse's School of Ballet. And it was, uh, uh, it was great. I mean, just, I just loved it, you know, but uh, I was only 17. <laughs> But from that moment on, I have I have not stopped teaching whenever I could. Whenever it was not working, I go and, and teach. And I've learned an awful lot about dance by teaching. You know, so lots of stuff that I never knew. You know, maybe I was doing it, but I didn't understand it. So, James, it's one thing for someone to have the dream and the desire to want to do it. And even after school and everything, and a lot of people will open a dance studio in their hometown or whatever. And uh, I had an incredible mentor in my hometown of South Carolina, and she opened a little playhouse in her backyard uh, that I used to go to every Wednesday and Thursday afternoon uh, and do elocution lessons and uh, read from the classics and everything. But what was that, uh, what was the incentive that got you uh, outside of your parameters and got you to Hollywood. How did that happen for you? Well, from starting dancing at eight years old, and um, uh, by the time I was 14 years old, my teachers came. I mean, I was already dancing everywhere and in and around Boise. I would go to uh, children's hospitals, and, and I loved the dancing around the beds and, and seeing the look on these people's faces when they, you're dancing for them. And they're always, I, then I, I, I knew I began to need it. I began to need that um, uh, from like the audience. And I still have that. I still have the same love of the audience. And anyway, so, so uh, my teachers there came to my mom and dad and said, it might be a good idea if you take him either to New York or to Los Angeles because we've been going away for two or three years to learn stuff to teach him. And I was, and she said I was learning it so quickly that it was like it's time to take him somewhere else to learn. Wow. So my mom set up a, a, just an interview at the Louis Dupron School of Dance on La Cienega Boulevard, North. Um, I was going to go down and possibly have dance lessons for a month. And my father uh, was not against it, not for it. He was totally against it. My mother pushed that through, and we got on the Greyhound bus, and we went. And I, 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 Excuse I remember me, was, going, it just, was it just your mom and you that went on the bus? Just, bus? Okay. Just my mom and I. And my, my dad said, when I left, she said, Okay, you got a month. If you're not a star in a month, you're coming home to be a lawyer. <laughs> Sounds like my father. <laughs> so anyway, I went into Louis Brown School, and Louis wasn't there, but I danced for them, and they gave us a schedule. And my, I remember coming out of there, and my mother says, we, we don't have enough money for this schedule for a month. So on the way to, we're going to go for lunch, and we're walking towards Beverly Boulevard uh, from like Santa Monica down towards Beverly Boulevard. And um, she stops. The, they used to have, you know, phone booths on the street. So she went in and she phoned dad and dad said, uh, absolutely no more money. Period. Mm -hmm. So she, we're, so we're going for lunch and right at, almost to the corner of Beverly and La Cienega Boulevard, there was a placard on the street saying Gene Nelson teaching tap and jazz. So I said, Ma, we got to go in here. Let's go in here. So I went in and, and met Nico Charisse. Wow. And, and with, his, with his hair like this and, and his pants rolled up and barefoot. 
and a key, big key chain from one foot, one pocket to the other. And he, uh, I danced for him, and he sus he sussed out the situation right away, and he he offered me ballet uh, scholarship for the month. I wouldn't have to pay for my ballet, but just pay for his guest teachers, which is Gene. And, and Sammy Davis was coming in, and Lee Scott, and there was a lot of guest teachers. But so we still didn't have enough money. My mother said, you know, said, we got it. It's probably going to be a shorter trip, maybe two weeks. So we go across, kitty corner across the street to the Al Rexall drugstore, which is there. Uh, I don't know if it's still there now, but uh, it's still there. We went in and turned right to the, to the cafe area. And there was a sign saying waitress needed. And my ma walked up and got the job. So we didn't have enough money for me to stay the entire month. Isn't that magical? Well, that God bless your mom. God bless. What, what's your mom's name? <laughs> her, her maiden name was Lois Merle Thorpe. God bless and, her. Yeah, she's my first and everlasting angel. She was the one that made it possible for me uh, to have the opportunity to realize my dreams. I mean, we hear these stories about stage mothers, and uh, obviously, your mom was not the typical stage mother in the uh, in the style of uh, Rose Hovick of Gypsy, uh, but had uh, she allowed you to pursue your career in the way that you wanted to. How long did it take before you got your first uh, break in Hollywood? Well, after the month, after one month, um, my dad and my brother flew down and said, are you a star? <laughs> okay, we're going home. And we went into to settle up with Nico's and Nico's school and uh, and he and my parents said we're we're taking him home. And uh, so Nico said, "Well, I think he has a chance in the business, you know." So, and that's when he suggested he could live with me, uh, with Nico and his and his wife Zita, and his uh, his new son. And um, he would teach me how to lay dance floors. I could assist him in classes. I could make a little bit of extra money. And when I was there, and that's what started the six months in LA and six months back home again. And so literally a week after that, a week after that, Gene sent me to NBC. And he says, I want you to go there and ask for my ex-wife, Miriam Nelson. Now, Miriam Nelson was a working choreographer. So she was choreographing the Jack Benny Shower of Stars show. And I went and auditioned for her for an episode, Singing and Dancing with the Lennon Sisters, uh, Getting to Know You, Getting to... <laughs> so that was, that was my first job. And I was hooked, line and sinker, from that moment on. I'm just like, I, I knew this, that's where I wanted to be. And nothing was going to stop me. I just, so I just, everything I did from that moment on was to get reach my goals. To get to the next level. Absolutely. Just You're just moving forward. Um, now, being in this business, then it takes a team of people to surround you. Uh, how did your team start to come into place? Uh, did you have an agent? Did you have a manager? Uh, how did the people that start moving you forward start coming about? Well, Nico, Nico suggested a, a lady named Hazel Macmillan, who was a, chill, a child agent for children. Mm -hmm. And she had uh, one of her students, one of her clients was uh, Trudy. Her stage name was Trudy Ames. Her name was Trudy Ziskin. But she was like, she had done like 200 commercials. The girl was the commercial girl. Um, and so I, I met Hazel and she started representing me. So during that time, when I was 14 up until 17, she sent me out for acting jobs, which I got uh, three or four. I went on a Jesse James show uh, and then, a, uh, I don't know, a little television show. And also worked on, uh, 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 what was that? 
Mr. Novak TV series. Mm -hmm. I got a, a really good role on that, and I was on several of those shows. But it was uh, that's before what, 17 years old, mm -hmm. right? And after 17, uh, I changed. Uh, Hazel said you should you need a, a different agent now, and uh, she sent me to uh, oh I don't remember. It's, I keep saying I keep saying CMA, but it was not. It was one of the bigger agencies. And uh, they started representing me. And uh, I don't think that much came from it. All no, obviously, I mean, you were a great dancer. You had all of that under your belt. Did the acting come easily for you? Or did you uh, start with acting training? Did you have uh, teachers that you worked with? How did that come about? Well, it I wouldn't say it was easy for me, but it was, natu it was natural evolution. And... Uh, um, my first, my first acting teacher, his name was Blair Cutting, and he was the, uh, uh, I think, an assistant or a protege of Anton Michael Chekhov. Anyway, Anton, my, I can't remember the son. Is I think it's Anton was the son of Michael. Anyway, he he was uh, teaching acting there in West Hollywood, mm -hmm. and then from there I I went and I took acting lessons from Leonard Nimoy. Spock. Wow. Yes. And that was really that was really a, a real boost working with him, because it was uh, a different different approach totally. And it was uh, well, what was his approach as an acting teacher? Because uh, I've read a lot about him as an acting teacher and other people that I've heard that studied with him. That you know, of course, people such an iconic role as Spock uh, yeah. changed the trajectory of his entire life and his image. Uh, but he is was a great actor, mm -hmm. and what made him a great teacher? Oh, um, I think I think because he because he really cared. He really cared what you're doing. It was a more a, cere a cerebral approach to acting than with Blair Cutting. Blair was more like reactionary, natural. We're outside a lot, and. Um, uh, and Leonard was more intense, more of a method type uh, approach to it, and uh, very serious. Not uh, there wasn't anything light, but there was a lot of good actors in his taking from him. It was uh, a really good learning experience for me. Uh, and then, and then I, I don't know how it how it ended, but I think Leonard went off to do some more work, and 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 it stopped. But uh, from after that point, I haven't had taken acting lessons from anybody. I've acted, but I've acted all along. Most good dancers, most really good dancers are good actors. And they have to be because they have to tell their story through dance in the first place. Absolutely. Right? So it was, uh, it was a natural evolution. It's like I natural think, evolution from dancing to choreography and to so forth. I think that uh, it was Gene Kelly who said uh, that when you uh, can no longer tell the story through the spoken word, you sing it. And when you no longer can sing it, you dance it. Am I correct? Yes. Is it Gene Kelly who said that? Uh, so I, I do, because there's so many stories to tell, but you uh, go back, it's always fair weather, uh, Gene Kelly. Um, how did the opportunity for Hello Dolly come along? And here is this idol that you watched on the movies and then all of a sudden face to face and you're working with him on such an iconic film. Uh, Barbara Streisand, uh, when she went to work on Hello Dolly, uh, Funny Girl had not even opened yet. Uh, so she was, uh, her talent was obviously there. Everyone knew that she was this major phenomenon, still is. Uh, but yes. what was that experience like to meet Gene Kelly for the first time? Well, so many things have happened prior to that. I mean, I was in the movie Gypsy and then Bye Bye Birdie and Thoroughly Modern Millie and uh, so, did six films with Elvis Presley. And there's, a lot, there's so many things that yes. I've done. Yeah. When that... I'm going to jump back a minute. When I started to work as a dancer, and that was in the movie Gypsy, um, 
the seasoned dancers like Bert May or uh, Earl Barton uh, and uh, Buddy Bryan, people who dance come from before me, said, one day, Jimmy, you're going to get a long job, you know. And they were talking about, they did Seven Brides, Seven Brothers mm. and uh, uh, Little Abner, which are long jobs. Most jobs are like maybe a long job would be six weeks or seven weeks to do a TV show or a, a movie. Well, uh, when when the audition came up for Hello, Dolly, I mean, it was in the variety and, and uh, the reporter for sure. Well, almost every dancer in town was at that audition. And there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dancers. And it took a long time. And uh, Michael, uh, Gene was there during the auditions. Michael is giving the auditions and his uh, assistant, Sheila Hackett, Mm. Um, uh, for the movie, which he eventually married. And uh, uh, and it was just like, I mean, for me, it was like an epiphany. Because, I mean, I've, I've gone to auditions and I've been to auditions, you know. And all the dancers had, had the, well, we had the experience of auditioning. But this was, this was different. It was, it was, we knew, we knew, all knew that it was a, a all the best dancers in town were there. And we all knew there's something about dancers that's quite unique. Dancers, all the dancers want the job. They all want it. But right in the middle of an audition, they will help some other dancer mm. to learn the step quicker. Now, this doesn't necessarily happen between other artists, but dancers always do it. And it's just something that is remarkable. About it's that. amazing. Yeah, you're absolutely all, right. All we did was do the audition. I danced as hard as I possibly could, as like in everything else. And I was chosen as one of the 16 skeleton crew dancers. And our job was to learn every dance in the movie. And not only the ones that we were in, but I, I was given the responsibility of learning everything that Barnaby Tucker would dance because they hadn't, they didn't come in the beginning. We had three months of rehearsals with a ball, with a two-hour ballet, ballet bar every morning, and then Michael Kidd would come in and do a cartwheel, say, "Okay, let's go," and he'd start <laughs> choreographing. So you worked both in Garrison and in Hollywood. Yes. Yeah. Upstate New York uh, in Garrison. We stayed in Poughkeepsie. But in Garrison, they did all, all the fronts of the buildings to make it look like Yonkers 1929 and uh, 1920 and uh, even painted the street to look like it was uh, yellow rimmed bricks. You know, that was our yellow brick road. We all used to joke yeah. about it. And uh, yeah, we rehearsed there. And shot, uh, of course, uh, you know, uh, put on your Sunday clothes and and uh, three or four other, two or three other numbers, right? And that was uh, that was a wonderful experience. It was also d during the uh, race riots, so when uh, we were sequestered in the hotel in Poughkeepsie, so and you were there. I know uh, Tommy Toon is a, a dear friend of mine, mm -hmm. and uh, I know that uh, the scene where he is climbing the ladder uh, uh, to go upstairs uh, to, uh, with Barbara, that scene was shot. They were shooting that scene the day that Robert Kennedy was assassinated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, just so it, crazy, crazy time that was going on. And I also know how hot it was when you guys were shooting up there. Uh, it, he was saying that you were literally melting into the streets. Absolutely. You can see our footprints in the street. Yes, it was so hot. <laughs> and it was so hot. We we're, all, we're all in three-piece wool suits, right? And during the shooting of uh, uh, Put On Your Sunday Clothes, we're all coming around as a group around the corner, you know, Put On Your Sunday Clothes. And all of a sudden, one of the dancers go, <laughs> and faint. <laughs> <laughs> and and then right that right at that time, the makeup crew had a product called Sea Breeze. You can still get Sea Breeze, but it had alcohol in it, and it was you put it on the yeah. you were revived in a hurry. But that really came in handy. 
James, I want to ask about that time with, uh, I mean, you came along at a time with, you mentioned earlier working on the Jack Benny show with the Lennon sisters and, you know, in the time of the variety show. And then all of these, you were lucky enough to be in Hollywood at the time when these great big musicals were being done, like Gypsy and Finian's Rainbow, you were also in, you didn't mention earlier, but uh Thoroughly Modern Millie in this. How did that circuit happen? Did you get calls for certain films or did you hear it through the grapevine? How did you find out about these films and uh, how did you end up, did you have an agent that submitted you for these roles? No, no, it was, uh, well, there was always, a, the auditions were always listed in the Variety and Reporter. And if it wasn't, then we'd hear it through the grapevine because you're you're always networking with other dancers. And um, one of the dancers I worked with a, a great deal was Tony Basil, who's a dear friend of mine. Yeah. I choreographed, uh, I mean, I assisted her on many, many jobs. And we danced together uh, for years and years there. Wow. And uh, David Winters and, and uh, uh, all the people. We, we knew of the jobs that were happening and it was just like I, I don't know I'd like to tell you one of the stories um, I wanted I, I'd never worked or or met Bob Fosse Bob Fosse was also an idol of mine and we uh, I was working on Dolly I was contracted on Dolly and they called Universal Studios called me to come and audition for Bob Fosse for Sweet Charity mm. And I said, I can't miss this. You know, I knew that I couldn't do the job, but lots of times we, we went to jobs that we knew we couldn't do just to make sure someone new would see us, maybe remember us later on for another job. But it was a sensational audition. And again, I think it was seven or 800 dancers were there and it took all day. And I was, I had the flu. Mm. I had the flu. And fortunately, we're in like flights. There's 16 different flights of dancers. So I had time to take care of my flu business in the bathroom while the others were going through their stuff. And I come out and I didn't do mine. Well, gradually during the day, people weeded out that, uh, that, that Bob Fosse didn't think was right. And he ended up with a group of dancers that he wanted. And I happened to be one of them. And I was a band. I began to feel very antsy about it because you know, he, he had all of us there. And now we couldn't. Now we couldn't leave. And he's going back and forth, changing our positions, whatever. And I just, uh, I think the story was ends by uh, I was standing there and he's smoking and he's he's going back and forth. And he stops right in front of me and he's blowing smoke. And I went, I'm so sorry. And I leaned over and and threw up on the floor. <laughs> I'm sorry to laugh. Right <laughs> on the front of his loafers. And and he, he just bent over and stepped backwards out of his shoes. And he stood up and he said, go home. Oh, my it. God. I, wow. thought my, I thought my life had ended. I can only imagine. Oh. Now, uh, you know, James, at that time, were you, were dancers unionized at that moment? Oh, yeah. Ah, that was, because everybody wanted to be in the union. Yes. Both Screen Actors Guild or Screen Extras Guild, mm -hmm. right? So I wasn't in either for, uh, in the early days, but I, I was doing uh, the Phil Harris nightclub act in Las mm -hmm. Vegas. Mm -hmm. And uh, my dance partner in that show, her name is Leslie Evans. Leslie Evans and I, uh, right after that job, and then we also did Louis Prima's act, and both of us. So uh, after the Louis Prima show was over, um, he was going to come out with the first twist movie. And it was, uh, it was called uh, Louis Prima and, the, and something. Anyway, it was it was actually released one month before Chubby Checker's twist movie that made of course yeah. made history. Uh, so, in order to get in the in the union, because we had to be in the union to do the film, 
right? We had to audition. We auditioned for the union reps, and uh, we were called the king and queen of twist. <laughs> and that's what got us into Screen Extras Guild. They accepted us. And of course, of my our choreographer and then a producer said, nobody does a twist like them, you know, so it's unique. And that's how we got in that union. It was later when I got into screen screen actor skills, you know. So we, that was a real that was a real cool getting into screen extra skills because then we, I mean, most of the movies I've done is in screen extra skills, not screen actor skills. Hello Dolly and I think Finney's Rainbow, uh, I think we're a, we're a screen actors guild for sure, and uh, and we earned residuals from those movies too. So it was uh, in screen actors guild you don't you don't get residuals, right? But, but I mean, you know, it's it's interesting. Uh, yeah, I was very very fortunate to have Marge Champion as a dear friend, and Marge and I talked. You know, a, a lot of those films when they were sold to uh, TCM and everything, the films that she made at MGM. Uh, they never got residuals for those films, starring roles. So uh, were you an activist at all uh, as far as a union member uh, in Hollywood at all? Uh, were you... Not at all. Not at all. Um, others were. Other dancers were. Um, no, it never interested me. So, mm -hmm. But I, I mean, you can... I you say that. I was no, just go so ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You know. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. It was just that I was during those years from from uh, 1962, 61 to 1971. There was no end of work, and and for me, I was I was the there at the right time. I was the right type. I could do the work, and uh, people wanted me in their shows. So it was uh, I had a lot of work all those years and I was so busy doing that. Uh, that's what took all my energy and thought. Well, you had a unique style that you were able to, you talk about doing the Elvis Presley films, a uh, very unique style to his uh, dance and films. Uh, and then the, a completely different style of dance for films like Hello Dolly and Thoroughly Modern Millie. Um, yes that you were able to cross both lines. Um, and then you were also at that uh, crossroads where Hollywood was changing, music was changing, the film industry was changing, but obviously you're a great actor and you were able to make that transition as well. When did you start to feel a shift in the movie industry and everything was changing? I know that Hello Dolly, uh, the whole time frame that that film was uh, opening uh, was also, people may not remember, was also at the same time that Midnight Cowboy was hitting movie screens. Mm -hmm. So the way that people were going to movies and watching movies was changing as well. So when did you begin to feel as an artist uh, a real shift in movie uh, changing and the way that people went to the movies? I think it was it was during working with with Elvis. There's uh, uh, that whole period from 1960, well, 1967 through 60 to 71. There was there was a shift happening, you know. And and even even while doing Hello Dolly, the word was flying around that it's, it's going to be the last of the big movie musicals, right? And it was. Uh, and I don't think we really understood it, but you could feel it. And it was uh, then a lot of things, a lot of work started coming more on stage, and and uh, not so not so many. There weren't the big movie musicals weren't happening. They didn't happen again until Chicago and, and mm -hmm. uh, Moulin Rouge and stuff. So it was a it was a real big gap. But there was other work to do. I re I remember you mentioned how many different things. Uh, the more I teach my dancers now, the more things you learn how to do, the more, uh, not, not only, but all the disciplines in dance, you have to maintain your ballet and maintain any other discipline like tap and jazz and contemporary and all of those, 
you have to work, you have to do them all and, and also learn new things. The more things you know how to do, mm -hmm. your risk of being unemployed drops, right? Then you, you're going to work more because you can do more. Right. And you go and if you, as long as you don't lose the desire to learn, you know, along the way, if you think you've made it, you know, and you're not going to learn anymore, that's then you're going to stop for sure. So it's just and, and of course, at Nico's studio where I train most of the time, um, he thought there was everything going on in that studio and you were required to take everything. And it was it was the best training ground uh, I can imagine. That's right? wonderful. Now, not only do you have this joy of uh, performing yourself, but also the joy of teaching. So you have the best of both worlds. Was there ever a time in your career that was a difficult time for you to get through? Uh, and if so, what got you through that period? You know, I think back and I, I've had such a charmed life. Uh, I think the I think the hardest time uh, was here in Vancouver when my my daughter was injured. She was seriously hurt by a truck hit her on her bike. She was ten years old. That was probably the roughest time. And for my wife and myself, my wife's name is Charlene. Um, that was the toughest time for both of us. We were, we were both working here in Vancouver in in uh, television and stage. And of course, she's in the hospital, and it's and it's uh, questionable whether she was going to survive. But she did. Thank God. Thank God. Yes. Uh, but it was a real tough time for both of us. And it's every everybody has their their rough times. I never um, I never doubted what I wanted to do. I never lost my love for it. Uh, people now, I just. Just, I got to tell you, the other day, I just finished, uh, I'm still dancing. I, I just did another TV show called uh, uh, Grease, The Rise of the Pink Ladies. The new TV yes, series. I know. I, 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 I want to talk about this. Okay, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm jumping uh, again. No, no, Grease is, it doesn't stop. It just keeps It going. doesn't stop. And I, uh, thank God. So tell us about this next project that you're working on. Okay, I'm, I'm going to backtrack just a bit. Before this, I went to Calgary. I was staying in the Calgary to dance. We're, we're dancers, but it turned out it was really an acting job. Um, but it was it was staged by a choreographer that I'm working for. So it's, it was it's based on a game show that's very popular worldwide called The Last of Us, and it's about an apocalypse and, and everybody is a huge terrible pandemic. Well, I played this infected creature that had fungi build up all over my face, my neck and stuff. And um, it took five full hours to get this makeup on in the chair and about two and a half hours to get it off at wow. the end of shooting, right? It was crazy, but a new experience. I'd never done that. And we, when we played these people who were infected. Well, this, this job, now I'm dancing on the right, Grease the Rise of the Pink Ladies, we play um, this group of club founders at Rydell High School. Mm -hmm. This boy back in 1918. And it's a, a portrait, a huge portrait of six of us that were the club founders. And we're all in, in uh, turn of the century tuxes. And I, they put some hair on me and so some glasses. But the other thing they did was that we had to look like the portrait, right? So they painted all of us for the shooting day. They painted us, and it took three hours to paint us and to make sure the, the reflections on our cheekbones or our knuckles or whatever. It was so precise. And then we come. what happens is we come alive and dance with this young well, young star on the show, and uh, and uh, and it's it's an edgy number. It's not like a great fun like like showbiz number. It's uh, we're arrogant, well off, racist jerks trying to and telling her what it's going to take to get into this club, and it's very racist. 
but it's edgy and it's fun to do because the, the character is good. That was the, my, this is my point. Um, in Los Angeles, those years, those early years in Los Angeles and growing up, I wanted to be one of the dancers on Carol Burnett TV show. Those mm. dancers, they, they bought their homes with that job. I know, and, I know. The Ernest Flat dancers, Ernie yes, Flat. Ernie Flat. Okay. Very but they're all taller. They're all tall guys. I was <laughs> never a tall guy. <laughs> so well, I got character work. So that's what the, that was the uh, that was the offshoot. It was great. I well, got and stuff. you work, and thank God for all the work you did. Uh, I, we're going to give away. Uh, I'm going to give away a, a special prize at the end of the show. Um, the word that I pulled today is ethics, uh, because it's something that's very important, especially in today's world and in this business. And I want to ask you. Um, in your career, obviously, ethics are very important. Um, what does that word mean to you? And how does that word resonate in your career? Okay, this is, a, this is, I tell my students, I you don't cause waves you don't make waves sometimes dancers are jaded to the point where they start grumbling about this or grumbling about that well that gets around in the business quick and those people aren't hired the next time there have been times when I've gotten jobs over dancers who are better than me but it's because the producer knew my attitude was bright and positive and cheerful, and I, I would be good for the company. And also, when whenever you stop a job, whenever you stop a job, your 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 main objective is to keep your chops up, get back into class right away, and stay in class until the next job. So that you, whenever you get a call for a job, your lack of ability for doing that job and your technique and your uh, shouldn't be the reason for losing a job. It should be a, only that you're the wrong type, right? Because if you if you go for a job and you're you're not ready for it, and you don't have your chops up, that's your fault, and you won't get the job. And pretty soon, jobs start to disappear, right? Work hard, work hard, work harder than you ever thought you had to work. And Absolutely. pretty soon, work uh, doesn't become work. Uh, Rose would like to know, uh, when is uh, the rise of the Pink Ladies? What is the scheduled date for that to come up? Do we know? We don't, we don't know yet at all. No. I mean, I, I, I probably should <laughs> talking about it. If they hear about this, they're going to be uh, PO'd. But because we couldn't take pictures of anything, we couldn't even mention the title of the show. Right. Well, so, it, it's a surprise, everybody. <laughs> So um, uh, I end my shows with my homage to James Lipton, who uh, watches over me uh, inside the actor's studio. So I've got some uh, random questions that I put together for you. Okay. And uh, the first question that I'm going to ask you is, what is the poorest that you've ever been in your life and how did you overcome it? The poorest? Um. <laughs> There was a time when I wasn't uh, working very much, and it was uh, I was in Hollywood. I had a, I had a little apartment in in West Hollywood in the hills, and it was uh, I think it was it was ninety dollars a month for that apartment, which was at that time that was a lot of money. Um, we had uh, unemployment. Uh, I had sixty five dollars a week from unemployment. And a friend of mine introduced me to the game of snooker at a pool <laughs> hall. Yes. And I went in with it. He taught me the game, and I found out I was good at it. So uh, that carried me through a rough time financially because I, I start, started playing for money, which is uh, and only just enough to get me by. Just I, to get you through. Well, whatever it takes. Um, and maybe you've just answered this next question. Are you a fighter? A fighter? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. 
Um, now, I'm asking this next question. Uh, before we started the show, I asked you your favorite uh, singer, and uh, I know your wife and Barbara Streisand. Mm -hmm. um, this year also is, uh, and you've done, uh, you know, many great musical films. Uh, this year is also the 100th uh, birthday of Judy Garland. Um, and I want to ask you about Judy because one of uh, my uh, fans who watches the show a lot uh, asked me to ask you because you've done so many great musical films. Gene Kelly, you mentioned his first film was with Judy Garland. Um, are you a fan of Judy? And if so, um, you know, a favorite moment of uh, hers that uh, really stands out for you? Absolutely. Um I mean, Judy Garland is the other singer that is uh, unmatchable, you know. The um, uh, one thing about Judy Garland, Judy Garland was was a better dancer than anybody gave her credit for. She was really good. Not only was she a good dancer, but she was such a good actress when she danced. I remember watching her, even watching her with Mickey Rooney. My, I couldn't take my eyes off of her. Even mm -hmm. dancing with Gene Kelly or Fred Astaire, I just couldn't take my eyes off of her because she was powerful and she was honest. Everything she did came from an, an honest source. Um, my, only, my only encounter with Judy was I was dancing on... I was guest dancing on the Danny Kay TV show at, at, uh, at CBS. Mm -hmm. And we had a break. And her show was being taped. Her yes. series was being taped at the same time. Well, I had the pleasure of going and we said, if you want to watch a, her rehearsal, uh, uh, her guest star is Barbara Streisand. Oh, no. <laughs> and I walked into the other studio and I watched them rehearse the song they did on the show. You did not. I did too. Oh, I was standing God. right there listening to them. Wow. That was that was just startling. Oh, startling. Now lucky you. Wow. Yeah. Just it's just timing, you know, being in the right place at the right time. That's great. Um I, I've mentioned this on several shows. Uh I've interviewed uh this incredible woman uh named Patricia Stark. She's written a great book that I recommend to everybody called Confidence, C-A-L-M-F-I-D-E-N-C-E. Mm. And she talks about these people that instill confidence in us and build us up. So I'd like to ask you to name four people in your life that instill confidence in you and build you up. I remember it distinctly one time. Alice Faye, the movie star, Alice Faye, was married to Phil Harris. She came on stage during the, after the Phil Harris show and walked right over to me, took my face in her hands and said, I can see it in your eyes. You're going to do great things. Hmm. And that was one of the times that I needed to hear something like that. And uh, Gene Nelson and his confidence in me and telling me about uh, what's going to what's going to happen to me in the business, Nico Charisse. Um, I would probably think. Oh, the other one would be Natalie Wood. And when I worked on Gypsy, she was very very sweet and and supportive of me and liked what I did, and she told me so. But I've you know Richard, I've had so many times the people have done that right when you needed the mm, encouragement it's done and you go you know you're on the right track and uh, it gives you strength and it gives you the will to keep going that's great but at least it helps that um and i want to ask you what classic films i mean the oscars are coming up next week uh what classic films still resonate with you do you have a favorite movie that you could watch over and over again? Oh, lot, lots and lots. Of course, of course, Singing in the Rain, American in Paris. Um, I was a cowboy all my life growing up in Idaho. Uh, the movie, The uh, Unforgiven, Clint Eastwood. 
Um, gosh, oh, there's so many. West Side Story is probably foremost, um, the 61 mm -hmm. version. And, um, oh, gosh. Oh, there's there's actually so many in The Godfather. And there's, there's, a, there's oh, oh. Uh, to kill a mockingbird. There's films that are that are just totally always going to be there, and there's there's there are much more. I just yeah, that's great. Great titles off the top of your head. How do you desire that others see you at this point in your life and career? Um, kind, humble. Um, and loving, and it's the only way. It's the only three things that will always get you by. And I love that. That's wonderful. Um, gratitude is something that I practice daily. I'd like you to name. Uh, I want to. I'm sure you do too. Uh, list three things that you are grateful for. I'm grateful for my mother. I'm I am too. I am going to tell you. I'm grateful for your mother. <laughs> I'm grateful for whatever my parents instilled in me in terms of confidence and uh, and also the, what whatever I brought into the into the package myself has always been there. I've always what I've always been positive and uplifting, I think. And um, I think, gosh, what else? Um, and the, the actually the support and love of all of all of my I got I got to put it this way: everybody who's ever helped me, because you can't do this alone. You cannot do all this alone. Somebody along the way has got to help you, right? These people. Whether they're they're professional people you work with, or your teachers, or your English teacher, your, your history teacher, anybody who opens a window for you or a door and enlightens you and shows you the way, these are the, my angels, and they're with me my entire day, every single day. I remember performing in a, a little club in a show called um, Dames at Sea. I love the show. Oh yes, yes. And I, I, I did the Gene Kelly role, and it was uh, every night, right? I'm very strange. Just before I would go on, all of a sudden, I would see Nico Sharif's face and Gene Nelson's face, and Alice Faye would be talking to me. It was just, it was kind of weird, <laughs> but they, they're with you forever. A friend of mine was doing Dames at Sea, and I went to a production one night, and I fell off my seat when he came out on stage and he, uh, the lyric was, um, and you know, the original lyrics, it, uh, and I, it isn't Jack the Ripper. It isn't that, 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 it's you, it's you, it's you, but he changed it to, it isn't Richard Skipper. It oh. is. <laughs> um, I want to ask you, That's good. Uh, do you journal or, uh, have you thought of writing your memoirs? And here's my here's my big news, Richard. I just officially signed with Bear Manor Media to publish my book, and it's uh it's, it's huge. I, I've been waiting to announce this, and I and thank you. I, I have the opportunity to say it on online here and on the and show. Exclusive here. It's an exclusive. It is, and I've been working at it for. I've been writing. For three years, my dancer friends in L.A. have been encouraging me for a long time before then to write it. And I started writing it, and I began to read it, and it and it, <laughs> it sounded interesting to me. So uh, I sent my uh, proposal to two different publishers. The first one wanted to do it, but it wasn't the right deal. And this one responded right away. My second one I sent to, and... the the reason why I sent it to them at Bear Manor Media is that they published Miriam Nelson's book, The Woman Who Gave Me My First Job. Wow. So that's another circle in my life. 
Well, James, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I hope you'll come back uh, when uh, the book is ready. Or oh, better yet, to. maybe we can do it on stage at the Pantages Theater in Hollywood. Oh my God! Wouldn't that be something? That would that would be <laughs> well. That, I would just die and go to heaven. There you go. Yes, me too. Me too. <laughs> and this is uh, my last question for you. What do you think is the best thing that you've done? for your industry? I have, to, I have to say that I think by always doing the best I could possibly do on every job, and let me preface this by saying, I've been asked several times, I mean, a hundred times, what is your favorite job that you've ever done? And I th I've thought about it and it's Richard, my favorite job is every single job I've ever done. I feel the same about each one. My attitude has always been strong and good. And uh, uh, it's just people know in this business, people know that I'm going to give them 110% every time I'm there. And I have that reputation and I cherish it, and I take care of it. And I make sure, even right now, I'm making sure that I'm, I don't slide in my abilities and stuff. I keep up, and I keep my, my, my spirit to learn is always there. And uh, because I'm not a master of anything. I'm a, I'm a student. I will be a student for the rest of my life. And that, folks, is the epitome of ethics. So uh, hold on for one second. We're going to give away a gift and I'm going to show you how this works. Uh, let me go up here. We're going to draw this and uh, I will pull my hands up here so you know that I am not pulling the winner. And uh, we'll... Tom Foley. Uh, so, Tom, uh, please send an email to Richard at richardskipper.com. Once again, Richard at richardskipper.com. And uh, I will be in touch with you and tell you what you won. Uh, so I'm going to pull this off. Uh, again, it's Richard at richardskipper.com. Uh, don't go anywhere for a moment, uh, James. I want to bring this up. I want to thank you for being here today. I want to thank everybody for being here today. I'm sure I can speak for James when I say this. Uh, we don't take it lightly when you show up. So everybody, thank you for spending an hour with James and me this afternoon. I don't know about you, but I had a blast. And I can't wait for this book to come out. Do you have a title? Yes. Can't Stop Dancing. Good. And don't. Don't. <laughs> Can I just get, uh, please give a thanks to Rose Apuzo. Rose Apuzo, yes. yes. I uh, wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for her. That's well, I love Rose Apuzo and... Uh, uh, she's going out uh, to Hollywood uh, later this week. I, I hope I get her back. Uh, they're going to take her and not let her back. So, Rose, I love you. Uh, but uh, for those of you who are here for the first time, I hope it won't be your last time. Uh, if this is your first time here, uh, please consider subscribing uh, to Richard Skipper Celebrates. My goal with this channel is to celebrate artists and their body of worth. So subscribe, leave a comment right here on uh, my YouTube channel and share this channel with your friends. And then after the show, I would like all of you, including you, James, uh, to do me a favor. I'd like you all to go to your Facebook uh, page and then I would like you to pull up the first name that pops up and I'd like you to reach out to that person with a phone call. Not an email message, not a text message, not a private inbox message a phone call and let that person know what they mean to you. Uh, if it's somebody you don't know, why are they a friend on your friend's page anyway? Call them uh, because as my dear friend, Sean Moniger says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. And I always say, if you're gonna go out in a boat, make sure you bring a skipper along. So uh, James, I'm gonna leave the screen and I'm gonna give you the final word. Anything that we talked about today that you want to build upon or anything that we didn't talk about that you wish we had, 
or just any message that you want to leave everyone with today, um, don't worry about how to end the show. As soon as you say goodbye, uh, the final credits will roll. Thank you, and I can't wait to have you back. Thank uh, you. Richard, thank you. Very much. And uh, it's all yours. Thank you. Gosh. Okay. Um, in my book, and towards the end of my book, I, I feel passionate about uh, talking about being humble and kind and, uh, and loving and giving the person you see or meet for the first time or every time the dignity they deserve and uh, to keep your hearts excited, you know, and keep, and keep uh, the thrill of just being here and giving, be kind, give to people. And when you're honest and you give to people, it'll come back to you in tenfold. Just do it honestly and you'll have a better time. And we, we're not here for a long time. We're here for a good time. I know you've heard that. Anyway, I want to say goodbye to you right now. And thank you again, Richard. And uh, take care, everybody. You know, and I uh, hope to see you again soon. Ciao.